Uh, welcome everyone to the latest question and answer session for STEM Learning's Managed Behavioural Learning course. I'm delighted that we've been joined um, by John Bailey again, uh, who has a vast amount of experience in this field. I thoroughly enjoyed uh, our last Q&A, John, so welcome again. Thank you. So we've got we've got many different uh, themes to discuss today, John, including routine scripting, um, SEN and exceptions, isolation rooms, challenging parents, low behavior, uh, low level behavior, and most challenging students. And finishing on something very topical, uh, which is managing behavior while teaching online. So I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts. So let's get started into into question one. So question. One. The first question comes from uh, Andrew and Alison around the theme of rules and routines. Andrew wants to know in regards of rules and routines, is there a limit to how many? And do you dedicate a couple of classes to them at the start of term or limit to X a number of routines per session? Or is it time well spent teaching all classes or routines? And in addition to that, Alison wants to know your three golden rules and routines. Uh, so over to you. OK, well, um, I must be careful that I don't write a book when I answer this because there's an enormous amount of, uh, of material here. Uh, first of all, let's make sure that we're clear on the difference between rules and routines. Rules apply all through the school day. They're, they're, they're kind of universal. So they're usually things like um, uh, arrive on time, properly, equi properly equipped, um, uh, listen when the teacher is talking and so on. So they're, they're general. Um, and it's a very good idea to have those, particularly if you're starting out, to have those prominently displayed uh, because it, it helps you to teach them. Although I should say my experience is that in most schools, the rule teaching is done by, you know, done in assemblies and by senior staff. But it's good to have, um, it, it, it's good to have visible reminders in your classroom, not least so that you can refer to them. So if I want to lean across and say, uh, Paul, have a look at rule number two. Uh, I think you'll find it means that you shouldn't be talking in my room uh, and it just helps depersonalize things a little bit it's not a conflict between you and the child um, you're referring to something up there routines are a different thing they're more specific to time and place and i think they belong to you in your classroom uh, they're how they're how children come in they're how they put their bags away uh, particularly in stem classrooms uh, they're to do with how you handle equipment uh, getting stuff out, putting it away, uh, safety concerns and all those things. So those are the routines. And I like the idea that routines also are things that happen every day because the idea is their habits and they turn compliance into a habit. So pretty much the same thing happens every time. Now, I just want to introduce one idea that I'll finish writing my book about this. Um, I think I got this from a trainer called Bill Rogers that I expect many of your viewers will be familiar with. Uh, but he talks about foundation periods and foundation periods are the times when children are listening. Um, it's sometimes the beginning of term, that first meeting. It's sometimes um, the beginning of a week. Um, it can sometimes be just that moment in the lesson when you know you've got their attention. You've got a chance to remind them of something. So choosing your time for teaching routines is very important. Um, I think the idea of teaching them as you go along um, coming into the room, leaving it tidy, where you want their diaries and things like that. That's probably the basic stuff. Um, I think you can teach some routine. I'd be a teach them as I'm going along chap, really. Um, but really the clear thing about them is you need to know exactly what they are. Um, what you don't want to be doing is, is being flustered and confused when something isn't going right. So I usually recommend to teachers, particularly when they're starting out, to make a list of what for them are the most important routines. And a last point, and I really will stop writing this book, is you can find those teachable moments. So, for example, when the class is working quietly without disturbing, you can say to them, class, this is what I mean by a working silence. I absolutely love it. And what you're doing is just dropping in uh, from time to time uh, what, what you what you think and expect. No, very, very clear. Um, a couple of points on that. That yeah, I think the, the habit, uh, that that habit uh, creation is a big one. So yes, they are routines, and you're teaching them rules. But as soon as you embed that as a habit for each child in your class, it becomes far easier. So um, 
you have to be consistent, right? You have to be consistent in those routines. Never let those routines slip. And, and, and the other point I think was really up there was you need to you need to know as a teacher what they are and why you're doing them. And therefore you can explain why they're important to students. If you just tell students do this and they don't know why that is the case, then sometimes you can lose them. So those two points are important, aren't they? Absolutely. And, and also uh, when it gets to, um, I think a little bit later on, we're going to be asked to those, about some of those children for whom it doesn't seem to work at first. Uh, and we'll come back to our old friend having the individual meeting uh, with a child. Uh, and what I usually say is don't waste much time in your individual meeting being angry with a child and telling them off because they just put their head down and wait for you to go away. But what you can do in, uh, in, a, in a together meeting is ask them to explain your rules and routines to you and ask them why you have it. Uh, uh, why you have those routines and in my experience children always accept that invitation and they always relax as that meeting goes on so you're rehearsing future behavior and you're giving them the chance to feel that they belong in, in your classroom yes of course I know what the rules are sir jolly good we'll just spend a few minutes explaining them to me yeah no that's it yeah really good point so we're going to move on to question two, which follows on nicely, actually, and it's about um, looking at routines and but resetting them. So um, Emmanuel and Dan ask, is it too late in February to give students rules and routines? And how would you make changes during the school year? And Molly asks, if certain rules or routines are not working, what is the best way of changing them? Well, in a way, I think this is part of the same question because I think that um, organizing those rules and routines, um, particularly the routines, is something you can go on doing throughout the year. Um, you look for that foundation period, you look for those teachable moments and I like to do it or I like to see it done um, in the context of a review. Yeah, here's what we've got really good at at the last year. Um, I, I really like the, the, you know, the way you're arriving uh, and, and, and I like all, all the work we've done with working together as groups, that's been absolutely terrific. But I tell you what, this term, I really want to focus on getting the equipment away at the end of the lesson because the room didn't look like a battlefield when you left. Um, that's enormously useful to the next class and enormously useful for me. So have a look around the room now because it's very tidy and I'm going to ask you a few questions about how we can make sure that happens at the end of the lesson. So I think I think we can, we can always do that uh, as we go through the year doing it in the context of what we've already achieved and, and looking at what we um, need to do next. And that's the same if something isn't working very well. We can say we've been very good at that. I've been thinking hard about um, how we get the equipment way. And I, I think I've got a better way of doing it than we, than we had last time. Uh, and so I, I, that's the way I do it. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, resetting and adapting and changing routines is fine putting new routines in is fine. Um, and it's all about, you know, why are we in the classroom? How do we improve the environment of the classroom to get to the goal of what we're trying to achieve in the classroom, isn't it? So, you know, if you need to reset the goals, uh, re reset the routines, that's absolutely fine. Yeah, I agree. Bingo. Yeah, bingo. And one of the things about, in particular about STEM lessons, I really like it when I see uh, scientists or technicians explaining, how we work in a science lab, um, how we work in a technology lab, um, because it, it gives it more context. Um, it, it helps the, the youngsters to feel a bit more grown up um, about what they're doing. And it comes back to your point that they're um, that you're, you're giving an explanation um, that they're understanding why those routines are in place. Yeah, absolutely. So let's move on to question three. Um, a question which I think follows on nicely from resetting again, um, because Mario, Mario Sole feels she's experienced the first distance learning damages on, on the teenagers she's teaching. Um, so Mario Sole's question is, how do you manage a classroom of 18 year olds who are noisy and find it hard to follow rules? It sounds like she uh, has a new issue with students since they've arrived back from the first lockdown. Uh, so what's your thoughts, John? Well, I've got two ideas sprang to my mind when when i was looking at it. i've got a lot, I've got a lot of sympathy for uh mary Soli if i'm saying your name right um uh first of all 
something's changed. They've been away and they've come back and, and they've got a bit older. I mean, some of them have been away for quite a while. That's quite a long time in the life of a, a, a young person. And it may be um, that you're relying on some techniques that used to work in the past. You know, come in, you know what to do, settle down, and they don't settle down. Then you find yourself getting a bit annoyed. And I think that probably there's a little bit of back to basics here. I'm saying, I, I'm, I'm so glad you're back but I need to concentrate on two or three basic expectations because you're, um, you're 18 now, you're going, to be, uh, you're going to be in college or the world of work uh, next year. So here's, some, so here's some stuff that we need to get sorted out. So it's really like resetting, but being just a little bit more uh, uh, strict and straightforward about it. And, and we also, in that context, now have up our sleeve the idea of an individual meeting with the people. So there'll be one or two people I can remember it myself, I remember thinking I was too old for school and wasn't um, uh, too interested in paying attention to what teachers had to say because I thought I was uh, about to go out into the world and, and knock it down. Uh, and I can remember a couple of people sitting me down and saying, John, you're still here for another couple of terms. Here's what you do well. Here's what you need to do. And I'm looking for you to do this. Uh, so it, it's that question of um, uh, reaching out. Yeah, and it's that last point about reaching out that I think we have, we have to take into consideration. We know these, these students have lacked structure, they've lacked routines, they've potentially lost their kind of self-esteem, their goals, maybe suffering with you know mental health issues. So having time to sit down with them again and just almost reset their mindset a little bit into you're still here, you still need to learn, this is what we expect, and, and, and try and build them up a little bit. I think that's where, that's where we need to go, isn't it? Yeah, that, yeah that, that, that's absolutely brilliant. And, you know, in that context, as well as, you know, thinking about their behavior, we probably need to think a little bit each time about our own teaching. It may be that in the past we got away with the, um, the slightly rambling 10-minute explanation from the front of the room uh, because they, they knew us and trusted us to get to the point eventually. Um, and perhaps we need to be a little bit more... Uh, uh, tight and episodic in our teaching. Um, one thing, a thing that an idea that I sometimes try with newly qualified teachers is say, imagine you had laryngitis and you couldn't talk to the pupils. I want you to desi design a lesson uh, that you could use on, on the whiteboard so that there'll be clear and explicit instructions about what to do and what to read. And um, you'd hold your throat and just point at the sign telling them what to do next. And if you did that, um, the instructions that you would put on the whiteboard and the tasks that you would give them would be crystal clear. And you'd be amazed how well they'll respond to it as well. It's a, it's a real good technique. I like the sound of that one. Um, and I've seen it many times myself where lessons have fell down just because teachers have spent too much time with teachers speaking and you lose some students. So getting them onto a task as quickly as you can um, it's, all, it's also key to that. So, yeah, I really like that technique. Mm -hmm. um, okay, question four is moving on a little bit, and it's around the idea of scripting um, and, and not feeling natural. So, uh, Mrs. Smith asks, how do you stop being like a robot when you're trying to implement this consistency of habits? I feel like I'm going to be following a script which might be unnatural for me. Yeah, that's a good one. You know, there's um, there's a an article I read years ago about the sociology of work that I really liked, uh, which talked about um, uh, you can think about all public service work and, and teaching is one of them as having kind of three phases. One is where we're just going through the motions. Good morning, children. Sit down. Well done. Well done. Good job. Sit down. Well done. And you can feel awfully robotic when you do it. But then you get a bit more um, used to it and you put the clothes on. Uh, I'll bet you do this a lot, Paul. You can arrive at work uh, not feeling absolutely brilliant and not not wanting to do a day's teaching. But the first thing you do when you see a child going into a lesson with their coat on is you say, you're looking really nice and smart this morning, Andy, uh, to put a smile on his face. Saw your football team did quite well last night. By the way, pop that coat off with, with you, will you? And it's it's what you do, uh, and and you've got you, you've got so habitually you, you've habituated uh, those commands, and it becomes less robotic because it belongs to you. 
it may be that you that we can get to stage three in uh, in our work, which is where we're being completely and naturally ourselves. And it, we, maybe we can get to the stage where we can say to a child, I'm not feeling terrific either, but let's go in there and do the best we can. But I think that most of us put on the clothes. And so we, we, we develop this language um, and, and start using it on a regular basis. Um, someone once gave me some advice for the, the, the first two weeks of teaching. And she said, um, she said, John, the best thing to do is be a bit of a psychopath. And I said, I said what on earth do you mean by that? She said, you follow everything up. If you make a promise, you keep it. If you set a, if you, if you set a rule, uh, you enforce it. Um, and if you're up to midnight phoning parents, don't feel too bad about it. So I think she might have been saying that maybe you go through a bit of a robotic phrase uh, when, you're, when you're starting off, but pretty soon they'll know where you stand and you'll start wearing those clothes naturally. Yeah, uh, and and it's this idea of performing. I think you, I think you're absolutely right. We've all had those days where you've gone in and you and you're just like, oh, and you 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 get there and you you perform. It's a performance sometimes, and I think um, the more you perform, the more natural it becomes. So following a script becomes a habit, and then as you said, you can hopefully get to the point where that habit becomes so natural. Um, and I believe it's 66 days of a habit, which uh, which which gets you to the point where it feels a bit more natural. So yeah, keep going. And I, I love the point around relentless. You have to be relentless, especially in those first days with follow up. Um, and the students soon trigger on that they won't go away. You know, if you do it with Mr. Thornton, he's going to get you in the end because yeah. you will follow up with parents. And as soon as that message comes through to the, the students, I think that's when you'll see an improvement in their behaviour. For you, um, obviously there are that there will be um, uh, exceptions to that where, where students are difficult for every teacher. But that's another that's another question we may delve into a little bit later. Yeah, I, I, I agree absolutely with all that, and I'm, I'm looking forward to talking about the exceptions because there are exceptions. There will be. Absolutely. Okay, we we we're moving actually on nicely to potentially um, discussion around this. Um, and Joanna and Mary have a question around SEN. Uh, they ask, would any of your behaviour management techniques differ with SEN pupils that are in mainstream classroom? And if the rules are working for all students apart from, let's say, one child, should we be making separate rules for him or for her? Well. I've thought a lot about this. In fact, I went for a, a wee walk around the park before we talked this morning because um, I think we need we need to have a really clear internal answer to this question. Do we need to make exceptions? The answer is yes, of course we do. Um, I've recently been doing quite a lot of reading on ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. And there are things like um, uh, growing up in a home where you're abused or neglected uh, or under daily threat or there's drug misuse going on. And those figures, certainly in, in the United Kingdom and the United States, and quite a large part of Europe, are very high. Um, and I think probably all around the world, uh, the effects of COVID will have, will have, will have had an impact um, on the way young people think and feel. And it reminds me of that bumper sticker idea that I use a lot, uh, which is that nine times out of 10, children are trying to cause problems they're trying to solve them. Um, and children who uh, uh, suffer from uh, mistreatment or neglect um, have their fight and flight uh, mechanism turned on all the time. They're often too ready to argue or they don't want to communicate with you. And working with those children, um, we certainly do have to make allowances. Now, I think two things about that. One is that when we're introducing rules um, at the beginning of term and we're explaining why we have them, um, I think fairness is a really important issue um, and saying you know, all these rules are important but the most important thing for me is that you do well in the classroom here and that you feel we're fairly treated and I'll make sure I treat everyone as fairly as possible. And, if, well, and, and then that breaks down to two, two situations. One is the, there's the expected ones. Maybe there's a child who has permission because they, 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 they have a behavior plan and so on to leave the room if they feel that things aren't going to go quite right they've got a signal uh, and and a child says you know sir why are you letting you know, why, 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 is, why is Ahmed allowed out of the room you just need to say it's an arrangement we've made and if you remember I'm being fair to him and I want to be fair to all of you um, and 
I make sure that I deal with everything um, in, in good time. And secondly, that there are the unexpected situations where uh, we might make um, an allowance, a child settles down in the corner, Ahmed's still not getting on with the work, that's my concern. Your concern is to get on with your work as quickly as you can. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough issue, and I hope it doesn't come up too much at first. Uh, but if we nail ourselves to the, um, uh, to the framework of ensuring that every child follows every command first time, bang on the nail, it's not going to happen. We need to be quite clear about that. Yeah, no, I agree with everything you were saying there. And um, it's, it's again, I think it goes back to the point of understanding the needs of every child and ensuring the needs are met. So, you know, um, SEN covers a broad range of needs. So you have to go by case by case. Um, but if you know your child and you're ensuring that their needs are met in a fair way, then, then that's the best approach. It doesn't mean you're lowering your expectations. I think, I think it's more about patience because of the different need that that child has. And yeah, uh, the point on um, other students seeing that and then seeing unfairness, I think that's a real um, a real challenging one, which I've dealt with in the past as well. And they, they see unfairness because they're not being um, treated in the way that they're being treated, but it's it's kind of allowing them to understand that at the start, I think was what is what you said, which um, yeah, is key, yeah. And, and there's, some, there's some other stuff that wraps around that. Um, uh, I, was, I was going to say a colleague, but as my wife uh, wrote a book that's got a, a large interview with a series of interviews with troubled, troubled children. And they say some remarkably insightful things about other children in their class. They'll say things like, you know, when the boys are playing up, there's always a reason for it. You know, there's always a reason. They understand each other uh, much better. Uh, than we give them credit for. Um, and the other thing to bear in mind um, is that you, you, we've, got, we've got programs like um, uh, Guardian Angels, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, mentoring programs in schools. Um, the more we use that, um, the more we're, we're beginning to give people, we're beginning to give young people um, emotional intelligence. So that all comes into it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I really enjoyed that discussion. So going to move on a little bit into um, question six, which uh, follows on a little bit because it's about it's about the challenge and needs of certain individuals. Uh, Chris, who works in an isolation room in his school, has a question about students who arrive to him in a negative state and an often angry state. Uh, and this is what he says. I get to see the same students regularly and try to build a rapport but I'm dealing with negative situations that are between the students and other staff members. How do I encourage the students to follow the rules in my room when they don't follow the rules in general? Well, I first of all want to send my regards and respect to Chris. Um, uh, working in the isolation room, particularly if you're doing it uh, for long periods of time without a break, uh, demands an enormous amount of use. I want, I want, I want Chris to be uh, kind to himself. Um, I also think we need um, we need routines in the isolation room, and um, uh, uh, having the language to say to children, "Come in, calm down. You're not in the classroom now. You're here. You're going to be here for another hour. And there's work for you to do. Get your coat off. Sit down. Take your time. Uh, uh, and and I'll come back in a few minutes. See when you're ready to get started. Having that vocabulary for managing is really important. And um, sometimes. Sometimes those children, those children come in. Um, uh, what's the phrase he uses? I've got it on the screen here. Uh, in a negative state, often angry, and it's often and it can be useful to think of the child's anger cycle. Some children uh, blow up, and then after it's over, it's, it's completely dissipated. And they can't understand they're there. Um, uh, for other for other children, anger takes a lot longer to die away, um, and they can you know, they can come back at you again and uh, and suddenly get you know, full of a sense of injustice about what's happened. Still, other children feel slightly ill or sick after they've been angry, and having a, a think about the, the the profiles of the children you've got in front of them um, helps you to think um, about what language they need to use. 
In the larger context, and this is getting on to where it's more difficult to talk about, um, a timeout room is, in my opinion, meant to be a solution to um, a, 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 a problem of not being able to teach in the classroom. So the child goes to the timeout room uh, to cool down. And then there are two theoretical routes after that. One is you're ready to go back to class. And we mustn't forget the idea of rehearsing them. You know, are you going to go back in there and say, and go and sit in the corner, or are you going to give the teacher some eye contact and say, I'm sorry, sir, and then sit down in the corner? Um, or uh, if the child's been coming to the timeout room frequently, something else needs to be done. Someone, and it may not be Chris, but someone needs to talk to the teachers who are sending those children out. If it's happening across every lesson, then, then that child has problems and the school needs to be uh, addressing them. Um, and again, it, it depends a lot on how you get on with your colleagues, but um, uh, the teachers who are sending the child out, if it's possible to have a word with them, so you can talk better about how you can cooperate with it. I think we talked about this last time, you know, Paul, when we were talking about um, being the person with the, um, you know, with the walkie-talkie or whatever who goes around hoiking, hoiking troubled children out of classrooms. Uh, and it really needs to be part of a pattern of care. And it is a pattern of care. Um, you know, remember again, children, children aren't trying to cause problems. They're usually trying to solve them. Does that get us yeah. started? You know, that was really good. There's loads of loads of great points. And yeah, I think on the on the on that last point around um identifying trends, you know, is it a problem with the child? Is it is it a problem with the child and that particular teacher? Um so some form of data collection going on as to the child coming in and where he's coming from, so that someone probably pastoral team or uh, senior management can first analyze that data see what the issue can be and put things in place for child or be around the room at known times of conflict to support the child in in those rooms i think that's really really key i think as well i think you touched on it as about when they're coming in they do need to have a routine, but also give them a little bit of space to calm down. You know, we don't want to, um, depending on what your isolation rooms are used for and, and, and the routines are, but you do want to be saying, right, crack on with your work straight away when they're in that um, sort of fight or flight mode in their mind, they'll not be able to do that. So giving them some time, even have a chat with them about the, the issue, letting them come down, I think is, is, is key. And I just want to reiterate uh, what you said Running an isolation room is a thankless task, so you know, hat up to hat up to Chris for doing that. Um, yeah. and also, I, I and also, I don't want to just um, chuck him away by saying it's a horrible job. Good luck with it. Uh, Chris needs someone to talk to from time to time about these children and uh, and 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 about the strategies that he's using, and wherever possible, he needs to find out more about those young people, because yeah, we can talk about it being part of a larger system. If you've got three hours sitting in a timeout room with a bunch of difficult characters coming in, um, it, it, it's hard work, and he has he has to really put those clothes on in the morning and wear them uh, to get him through the day. So I do want to to encourage him not to go moaning to other teachers, but to, but to be addressing them as another adult and saying, "Now, uh, you know, I've had I've had Charlie in here uh, three times a week for the last four weeks." Um, can we discuss a bit more about what's happening with him um, and what the eventual solutions are? So I think I think maybe that's a bit of assertiveness as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's I think it's good practice to have conversations with um, a, a minimum the, the pastoral lead. So whether it's a head of house or a head of year, to say you know I've had X in here three times today, um, and, and and keep them informed of that over a day or a week, so they can have the conversations if needs be. But yeah, um, it's a tough, it's a tough old job, the isolation room. So as I say, well done, well done, Chris, and be kind to yourself on that. Okay, question seven. Um, is it about dealing with some challenging parents? I, I think we discussed this um, slightly before, um, but a question from Sarwat uh, who asks, how to deal with parents who are not co cooperative when told their child is not following said rules? Um. I hope this isn't repeating. Did I talk about key messages for parents last time? Um, 
Um, I think so. I think, yeah, I think so. Let, let's, let's just think a little bit more about those because it comes back to this idea um, about adverse childhood experiences. Um, let, me, let, me, let me take it from three directions. Number one is um, when, when we're in trouble with the children, um, it's very easy for the different agencies who are working with those children to start splitting. Uh, and splitting is a psychological term. It means um, putting all the bad uh, in one place and all the good in another place. So um, yeah, we, we don't know how to work this, 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 with this child because uh, his parents are absolutely hopeless. They don't cooperate with us. So bang, we've got rid of a solution uh, by attributing it to the parents. Um, if we then took a television camera into the parents' house, um, we'd probably hear that, those, that that school is really irritating and sends us these notes all the time and, and the teachers really don't really understand how to, how to, how to, how to work with our, with our child. So that's one thing. We really have to make an effort to reach out um, to those parents um, and, and, and not do that splitting. Secondly, and this comes from my experience with, um, I, I, I did quite a lot of parenting classes when, uh, at one time, um, and I always thought I'd, I might meet some parents from hell who would tell me it's a good idea to batter your child and, and, and what, what's, the, what, you know, what's your problem. And I never met those parents. What, what I, I, I'd sometimes meet parents who would be angry at the beginning, um, but after a little while they'd say, well, I don't know what to do either. Um, and, and they would be, um, they, they'd be just as upset and distressed themselves. And by the way, if they had ever hit their children, uh, they always remembered the occasion on which it happened and how bad they felt doing it. You know, they start saying, I was in the supermarket that morning and I felt horrible. And then the third thing is, as well as giving them those messages that we talked about last time, you're the most important person in your, 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 your child's life. I can't succeed unless we work together. And it's your child um, who, you know, whose outcome, where, where focus on you, is the important thing. And so the plan that I'm proposing is. And so I think that we need to present ourselves with a plan, with those care messages, and with a really earnest attempt um, to reach out to them. Because, you know, look at the phrasing of the question. I'm, I'm, I'm sure, um, I'm sure Sawat doesn't mean it, but we can't deal with those parents. We can't report them to the, you know, the International Parenting Authority um, to, to, to behave differently. And one of the things that we need to remind ourselves of is that, is that most children who end up with behavior difficulties coming from troubled homes, they're usually stressed households. There's very often not enough money, not enough space, not enough time, uh, difficulties. They're people who need help as well. So we need to be uh, the professional. And I suppose the answer is don't try twice. Let's try five or six times and always be reaching out to them. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. And I think that point around um, the parents in, in that situation usually, in my experience, usually did need that support as well. It's not that they don't want to to be involved; it's they need that they need that little bit of support themselves. So this idea of this triad, I think I mentioned last time, all working towards the same goal. So we're establishing what we all want for the child, and we agree that we all want that. And therefore, what is the plan going forward to, to get that? And in the same way as being re relentless follow-up, relentless in yeah reaching out to those parents. Not all, I, you know, I've been in situations where I haven't managed to get parents inside regardless of the amount of time uh, or, or any engagement. That's always going to be the case, but we, we do keep trying essentially to do that, don't we? Yeah, and we mustn't forget the positives either, must we? You know, I think I said last time the positive phone call is the thermonuclear weapon of the school. Um, and you know, and, and those those golden stickers going home when something's been done right, that they're, they're not only designed to to get some uh, uh, get some positive stuff going in the current situation, but they're money in the bank when we're building those relationships with parents. Yeah, no, absolutely, it's a, it's a fantastic point because. You, you expect a phone call from school and they're going to expect a negative and they get a positive and then, then their main tech change as well. And I think um, schools can do a lot of, or give a lot of support to those parents as well. I mean, the last school I was in, uh, we started offering kind of 
the, the similar sort of um, counselling that we give to the students for certain parents as well. So there's a role in that as well, I think, for schools to, to start to look at. Yeah, absolutely. OK, we're going to move on to a question around uh, which which comes up in pretty much all of the Q&A um, questions around low level behaviour. Um, and in this one is particular managing noise in the classroom. So we've got a user named ARB and Graham who have similar questions. One asks, what are your most useful tips for low level chatter and how do you figure out who it is? And Graham's question was, what I tend to struggle with most is numerous students making noise when I'm talking or presenting information to the whole class. In that situation, I can't deliver a microscript and then walk away. I need quiet so that I can keep talking to the whole class. How should I find the right balance talking over them and keeping a good pace or waiting quietly and potentially wasting time? <laughs> I think um, uh, I think we might be about to write another book here, Paul, and um, I, I think we need we might try uh, taking this in in, in turns. Um, first of all, I think it has a lot to do with how we how we teach and reteach our rules and routines. Um, I find it quite easy to say to children, um, uh, you know, we've made a lot of progress over this last few weeks. Uh, we've done this, we've done that. Um, and um, you're so much more mature in your answers. But I've got to tell you, I'm still getting talking under when I'm making a presentation. And just between you and me, it drives me absolutely nuts uh, because it means, uh, it means some of you can't hear, it means some of you can't listen, and it means I can't teach properly. So we really need to nail it. And so um, we're going to go through we're going to go through the teaching with Bailey uh, uh, rules procedure uh, noise procedure now. So uh, when I say the word, turn to your partner and talk to them in your low level voice, because this is the voice you can use when you're working together. Uh, and I'll give you a signal to stop and a signal to start. Uh, and, and they do that. And then I say, that was very good. Um, that's pretty near to a low level voice. But as a matter of fact, a low level voice is even quieter than that. So I want you to take that down another 50% and then tell your partner, uh, uh, repeat what the other, your partner was saying to you and do it now. And they always do it more quietly when you've rehearsed it with them. Selector. And then I say, and I go and model it myself, that's what low level talk is. And then I say, while we're here, we just have another second uh, talking about silence. So I want you to listen to the noise the room makes. And then we have five seconds and I say, that's what I want to hear when I want silence. Are we all clear? And then I don't practice with them being too loud because I've established my, um, I've established my quiet noise and, and my talking noise. Now, there are lots of other tricks around that. Um, some teachers use music. Um, uh, while we're on the on-task phase, um, the music will be playing. Um, and remember, I always want to be able to hear the music um, and not you. So you can talk quietly, but do it under the level of the music. And it means that you can, um, you can just walk up to a child and instead of nagging at you and say, I can't hear the music, Paul. And it, Sorry, sir. And then it, then it gets a bit quieter. And I turn the music off um, when, I want to, um, when, I, when I want children to listen. Um, and just before I give you the chance to write the other half of the book, uh, the other thing to remember is that is that I think one of the iron laws of teaching is that teachers talk too much. All our presentations are too long. We take up too much air time and we can't, we don't let them get on with it. So, yeah, we're, we're, I need quiet so I can keep talking to the whole class, says Graham. I, I, I know what you mean, Graham, but don't go on talking and talking and talking because to get young people on task it probably takes about 10 sentences max. Um, and and then make sure there's a clear indication left on the whiteboard of what it is they've got to do. Then get round the room, come at them from behind. Most of them will be working. And then you can be then you can get up uh, beside some children and talk to them about, uh, you know, give them, give them those low, low, those low level messages. Um, I, I, I forget where I learned the phrase, but ear messages. That, that's, what I, that's what I think when I hear Paul Dix talking about um, coming in and talking. It, ear messages really gets the idea of coming in and leaning in and saying, Matilda, a word in your ear. 
here's what I need for your, for your, for your talking level. So, your turn, Paul. Yeah, absolutely. But I agree with all those um, strategies and techniques that you would use. Um, and the, the point around actually showing them and teaching them how to do it is key, not just saying I need silence, show them what silence looks like, um, you know, show them what it looks like if they are observing you to demonstrate or observing you present, what does that look like? And, and, and I think a few additions to what you were saying is, you, you're absolutely right, don't talk for too long. However, you, I think you said something, uh, I think um, Graham said something along the lines of, yeah, waiting for quiet. Don't be scared to do that, especially in the in the, um, the early days. Don't be scared to stand there and just say, I'm still waiting for three people. I'm still waiting for two people. Don't have to name them because that gives them what they want sometimes, but they know that I'm talking and that he's, he's talking about me, so he's talking about me. And just wait until you have that silence and stop if you need to. Um, you know, there's, there's a great book, and I think I pushed this book out last time, but if, if you didn't hear the last one, uh, which is uh, Teach Like a Champion. Yeah. I don't agree with all the things in there, but there's some great things for low-level behaviour. So this non-verbal communication, I think you touched on it, in people's ear at the appropriate time. So you carry on teaching, but you've, you've noticed who it was and therefore have a quiet word in the ear afterwards. You know, I, I didn't appreciate when I was delivering that you were having a chat with your friends. So they know that you've seen that. But you're not making a big deal of it and another one uh, and i think you, again john you mentioned it circulate in the room if you're presenting you don't have to be always presenting at the front present by circulate in the room and walk over to the people that are potentially not listening and present from there and that sometimes um supports them in getting it right as well so there, there are as we say we could we could write a book there's literally a book about this uh, out there so but these are some of the um the techniques that we would we would use yeah uh, brilliant that circulating one I, I i love sitting on the corner of someone's desk who's bursting to have a talk with their mate but it's no good because i've bumped myself there <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm doing a really interesting explanation right in front of them <laughs> <laughs> exactly that exactly that okay so we've got um two more questions left uh, the next question is from um molly about the most challenging students um, that she deals with um, who, who seem to simply refuse to listen or follow the rules. So Molly states, I, I still worry about how to deal with the most disruptive students. Most of them ignore me completely. They don't respond to me or look me in the eye. Just wondering if there is a different way to deal with the most extreme students or situations. Apologies. Um, okay, well, Molly, I know what you mean. Um, I suppose there are children you know, who, who, when they're going through adolescence, um, uh, have difficult patches. And that happens, that, you know, the same as happens with, with pubescent children as well. It, uh, in, in fact, I think I've talked before about that idea of in adolescence, uh, children go through some of the stages that they went through in puberty before. So you've got a, a perfectly reasonable 14 year old who, who can turn into a, an argumentative, um, worrisome, difficult child. So that happens. And, and again, um, I would recommend um, anybody who's got the time to briefly read some material on the ACEs study, Adverse Childhood Experiences Studies, because um, uh, these children who don't respond all look in the eyes. Um, a starting point with thinking about them is in, instead of thinking about how much they annoy you is to think about what might have been happening to them um, to produce this kind of behavior um, but you're still we are still assertive teachers you have a right to teach and they have a right to learn um, so you're you're using your rules rewards and sanctions in the classroom you're teaching well and you're still getting no response uh, then you have to have other people involved with you as well. Um, so you you might start off with some one-to-one -one meetings with them, you know, making sure it's, the door's open and all that. Um, but it's it's sometimes a really good idea to have a, a, a two-to-one meeting with them. Um, find someone else who's an authority or, um, um, uh, or who they know well. And it, it's not running for help. I can sit down with a child and say, um, um, I, I wanted to have a talk with you because at the moment 
um, I think you're finding it difficult to listen. And um, uh, that makes it difficult for me to teach. And I don't think either of us are making much progress. And that's why we're having this meeting with Mr. Thornton today. Uh, and Mr. Thornton says, um, uh, because we've, we've talked about this before, Mr. Thornton says, uh, 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 Charlie, we're very lucky to have Mr. Bailey in teaching in the school today because he's, um, he's a maths teacher and, and it's difficult to get hold of maths teachers right now. And I need you, and, I need you to be working uh, to build a relationship with him. And so far it isn't working. Um, uh, what have you got to say about that? Uh, the chances are we'll get him talking. Um, he might say something like, well, I'm not always interested in maths. That's a huge victory because the young man's talked. Um, uh, and then you might say, um, I know that maths isn't your most brilliant subject, but I think next year you want to go into uh, record producing uh, and it'll be a good idea if you'd have some sense of number. And, I, and I'll, I'll jump in right away and say, yes, I, I, I see what's needed. And we might not have got off to the best start. There are 101 different ways to have a meeting with a student. But they all have that business of, of a beginning where we, 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 we set a target. And we, we, no, a beginning where we state some optimism. I'm glad we've met here. I appreciate uh, that we might be having some difficulties. There's an exchange of information. And then there's an optimistic end. But doing it, I, I think doing it with another adult present, provided it's done in a way that doesn't make you feel demeaned, is often the first step into working uh, with really disruptive students and also think about um and it doesn't mean that you lose your assertiveness because uh molly i don't know whether or not you've got children of your own um but if my boy was sitting in, well, he's grown up now but if my boy was sitting in, in schools blanking a teacher being angry and not and not being and refusing to recognize him i'd want someone to do something about it and i and i don't by that mean that i want the teacher to go and scream at them I would want the teacher to have uh, an expanding package of strategies for dealing with them. Yeah, absolutely. There's lots of really um, good points raised there. Um, you know, I think the key thing from that was, is there someone in the school who has a positive relationship with them? So that that conversation um, can be more impactful. I think coming from someone where the positive relationship is there is is is, is a big big thing. And what we did as a, as a school, or well, many years ago now, was we had uh, you know fifty or so students who were causing issues across school, and we asked which you know which staff had real positive relationships with these students so that we could uh, support uh, support them through like a mentoring package. But also we know who to go to if if we're starting to have issues with that individual child. So I think that's a good a good stretch to 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 push. I think. If I, if I step back a little bit and, and, and look at it, is where does this kind of um, behaviour from the child stem from? It, it, is, is it across school? Is it you as an individual? And therefore, the response to that is different. If it's across school and it's a bigger issue, there needs to be a support package put in place, etc. If it's just you, where is that born out of? Is it um, a poor relationship that you need to build? Is it because potentially you need to look at yourself and you haven't been relentless in the follow-up? Um, so you have to think about that issue first before you can solve it. Couldn't agree with you more. And, and also, just look at that. They don't respond to me or look me in the eyes. Now, that's an interesting remark, isn't it? Uh, I mean, it may be um, that the, we may be talking about a boy who's being a little prince and not deigning to look at a woman or not deigning to look at a girl. Um, or it might just be it might be a boy or a girl who's who's dissing you, um, but it reminds me of um, uh, you know some of the extreme behaviour courses I'm on. That um, you know, if you're thunderously angry, um, I'll say to you, Paul, Paul, I can see you're angry right now. I need I need you to sit down, and you stare off into the middle distance, um, and just to just to model this on the television, Paul, just look away from me now. If I say to you. Paul, Paul, you need to get this sorted out. But the first thing that you need to do right now is to sit down. And then I let five seconds go. I can repeat a message like that 
three times. Did you hear me when I said that? That's right, you're being yourself, but you're back being yourself, Paul. Now. <laughs> but yeah, that, that thing about wanting eye contact, children sometimes aren't ready to give us eye contact. Uh, and, and we don't necessarily have to be thrown by it. We, we repeat our message and then we either decide we're going to deal with it later, because if we tactically ignore it, we have to follow it up. Um, um, or, 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 or we might say you've made a poor choice. Um, I'll, be, I'll be filing a report after school. Um, but, but having a strategy for when children are blanking you um, is really important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think the the point you just made around um, the non eye contact. Um, I wouldn't take that personal. There's a lot of students can't do that because of their issues, their self esteem, what what they've been going through. So that's that's I wouldn't say it would be the the main issue. It would be the refusing to follow the instructions you're giving, which is the bit you need to, to solve more than the the eye contact issue. Um, would yeah. be my final addition to that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so moving on to question 10, which is a very topical question, and I'm looking forward to hearing some of your thoughts. Um, I haven't had experience of it, and, and, and I, we, we discussed previous to the, the recording that you have no experience of it, but we can we can give our thoughts on, on this situation. So um, we've got questions from both Sawat and Barbara. Um, one is how can light touch interventions be applied to remote learning setting? And the other is how do I manage behavior online? How do I get all my students to complete their tasks? So it's questions about behavior while delivering teaching online. So what are your thoughts? Well, I've, um, I've not done it either. But my online experience has been with, been with training teachers. <laughs> they always behave. Um, but I think there are some... In, uh, but I've, I've been I've done a bit of asking around since I saw this uh, list of questions. Um, I've, I've discovered instantly that, that schools are wildly various in the amount of latitude they give the staff. They give the staff for using Teams or wh whatever the remote system is that they're using for contacting students. A couple of really good examples I got was um, uh, uh, one where um, uh, 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 a special school uh, does a lot of online teaching. Uh, but you know they're in control of the cameras, and a lot of time, uh, a lot of times they turn the children's cameras off. They set the task so that there aren't opportunities for children to make secret signals um, uh, on, on the screen and all that kind of stuff. So that so that children get tasks um, uh, down the line, and they carry them out, uh, and they'll, they'll get occasional one to ones with teachers. Uh, but the gallery view, where everybody can see each other. Um, is really strictly limited, and um, if uh, it, and w I asked about sanctions, um, because because paradoxically, one of the things about teams and all that kind of stuff is is that you can do a lot more routinizing of of positive um, the, the the positives that you give out when people give right answers and so on. You've got all the reaction buttons you can you can check for well done, uh, but also in the case that I was thinking about, um, the sanction was be just being out of touch with the lesson for, for five minutes um, and also that uh, I was being told that um, uh, another advantage um, is that um, uh, your your feedback to the students uh, can be emailed to parents as well so you're enlisting the support uh, and help uh, of, of people at home um, I I was very interested in talking to these people about the um, the way they do their presentations, um, and two of them said um, it goes back to that point I was making on earlier on about uh, about the, um, the the laryngitis lesson, um, making lessons much more episodic, um, uh, understanding how long children have got to listen, how long they've got to process the material. And how how long they've got to respond. So that, that that's that, that's my early uh, research on it. Um, what what about you, Paul? Yeah, I, I agree. I think I think the key the key point is, and and, and Ofsted have released something very um, recently around live lessons not being the gold standard. And you know, I think these behaviour issues might be occurring because the opportunities for them to occur are there. So. If if you if you are delivering um, 
a, a lecture almost and you're trying to talk to the students and you're allowing the students to have their cameras on and watch and mics on or whatever it is that's going to lead to misbehavior essentially um we as adults would struggle to be in front of um a, a, a computer listening to people for two three four five hours and what's happening in some cases and therefore students are going to so i agree exactly what you said it has to be around small snippets of um what you're asking them to do but then they're aware they're doing the task they're, they're working as if you would in a normal classroom and you can go you can keep they can stay online without their mics on but you can you can chat to them and, and ask if anyone has questions and be there for questions to come back at you rather than this kind of delivery and um so yeah sort of take take control firstly of the platform so allow what what you want them to um to do and to to see so do cameras off mics off i'm talk you know i'm talking so there's no opportunity then make sure it's short sharp to the point as we said before that the, 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 the laryngitis idea i think that's that's key they do the work but you're there for them if you want if, if they want to ask you a question via the live chat or, or whatever and i think you're absolutely right as well if we can if we can engage the parents if it's going right and if it's going wrong um on, on the feedback that that'll be supportive as well uh, that's again that's just my thoughts on it i have no experience of it so um the hat goes off to all the teachers that are currently doing that yeah yeah and i guess and i guess the next place to look would be to talk to some people who are specialists in blended learning um because the, the technology does allow for student presentations um on 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 work that they've done and achieved um i'll do some more mugging up on that as well yeah it's a good point it's a great point so that that's all the questions I, again I've, I've really enjoyed um the, the conversation the discussions and, and the, the strategies that we've we, we've discussed and hopefully you at home have um taken something from it and some strategies that you could take away and try good good yes i've enjoyed it too you know before i started this morning i i, I was looking back through paul's paul dix's program um and at the end um he's got a he's got a 10 top tips um which I greatly enjoyed um, looking through, um, and I, I must say I, I I would strongly recommend. It's a really rich course, isn't it? It's, it's got a lot in it, uh, and th those ten tips I thought uh, I thought God, they're they're a really good thing to to uh, measure your your teaching uh, against. And he's he's very good, isn't he? On um, on on, we can't change children's behaviour directly. It's us that has to change. We're, we're the ones who have to. Uh, adopt these techniques and develop our understanding of the children in front of us yeah absolutely so um i, be I believe the people who um who see this q a have have seen the top tips so i'm sure they agree with with those top tips <laughs>